Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome uh, to our uh, second webinar in the series about the Base Narrow Dog. Um, tonight, you'll be hearing from both of us again. Um, my name is Dr. Aaron Forsyth. Um, I'm one of the directors of Advanced Animal Dentistry. Uh, I've been performing only um, veterinary dentistry now for 16 years now. Um, I love it. It's my life. Um, and um, I'm lucky enough to share the business uh, with uh, Dr. Tucker. Um, Bex, um, obviously on board tonight again as well. Uh, tonight, did you want to say anything? Introduce yourself at all, Beck? No, but I will. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm Beck Tucker. I'm the other half of Advanced Animal Dentistry. Um, I guess I've been doing just dentistry since 2015 now, so a few years. Um, and yeah, I guess if you um, missed our last episode, um, you can watch it on YouTube. So I've got a YouTube channel up and running now. Um, and that was basically just a run through of deciduous dentition in puppies and how to deal with um, base narrow canines um, in the deciduous dentition specifically. Um, yeah, so tonight we're moving on to um, the five to six month old base narrow puppy. So during that eruption period, um, when those lower canines and obviously um, upper canines as well are coming through and just trying to sort of um, hopefully give you guys a bit of additional information about ways you can deal with it um, a lot of the time in general practice, um, what you need to look for and um, the specific interventions that we can do at this age and when the right time to intervene is as well. So we'll get moving on that. Yeah, so I guess this five month period, this this is the time um, where we where we believe they should be specifically examined again. Um, what we're going to do tonight, we really just want to, I guess, describe the problems that we see at this at this time. Um, what are we actually trying to to deal with? What we're we trying to ascertain. We will outline our general discussion that we have with the client. We hope that that's useful. Um, I guess the kind of discussion that we've had, uh, the, sorry, the discussion that we have with clients is has been moulded over many years now. Um, it, uh, it's, it's classic. It's like your, your ATP or your, your flea talk, I guess, that you do in practice where you sort of hit play and just say the same thing you have for the last 20 times that week. Um, for us, this, this is what we're sort of, I guess, at that point. So we'll, we'll have an overview of that. We will certainly, of course, then talk about treatment. So the treatment's available for this issue at this age. And we'll briefly run through the complications that we uh, occasionally will see uh, with these as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, the other thing is, I guess, guys, if you've got any questions at all throughout, just feel free to um, interrupt. You can put your hand up. Actually, maybe not put your hand up because I'm not looking at that panel. Um, use the Q&A function or the chat function. So feel free to just throw a question at us whenever and we'll try to make it as interactive as possible um, and answer any questions along the way. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um. Okay, well, I guess we'll, we'll move on to describing what, what do we, what are we seeing? What are we actually talking about tonight? Um, so we're talking about these um, base narrow cases. So I guess base narrow, it's a bit of a catch-all term that I guess we went through last time. What we're really talking about, we're talking about specifically the, the eruption of these man, new permanent uh, mandibular canines. And the concern is, and, and the issue is, is that they're, they're, erupting into such a position that they'll cause some soft tissue trauma. And that's bad. Um, one of the first things I, I say to anyone then when I'm discussing this is that these canines are designed for one thing and one thing only, and they're designed to penetrate and traumatise tissue. And they don't mind what tissue they, they harm. And if it happens to be um, some mucosa or gingiva that is in your mouth, um, so be it, they will be traumatised. So that's, that's the brief description of, of what we're trying to deal with here. We're looking at the mandibular canines and now at five months, we're specifically looking at these permanent canines and they're erupting in such a position that they cause, or we expect them to cause, that's actually an important point, we expect them to cause some degree of trauma. Sure. We went through, I guess, last time, and if you've, 
you can run back and as what Beck said on the on our YouTube channel, we have um, uh, the the first webinar. We we discussed that a little bit more at a little more length as to the causes of this issue. But that's part of it. So going into that, um, talking to the clients, I want to cover a few of these these uh, issues. Um, I want to talk to the client and help them understand as to why this has come about. This is not magical. It's not nutritional. It's not the wrong I don't know, season. This is an issue with the development of, of either jaws or teeth. Okay? Both, both of them contribute to this. So what we're seeing here, we can see class one malocclusions where it's specifically uh, a tooth or, or teeth that are in the wrong position. Yeah, we often, I guess the um, breed, I think we're most often seeing that in at the moment is your oodle crosses, specifically the labradoodles. But a lot of the time we're now seeing it with cavoodles and um, the multitude of yeah. other breeds, Australian cobber dogs and um, now the mini, what are they, mini Australian labradoodles? And there's another yeah. one now that's the same cross as well under a different name. Yeah. Oh, yeah. actually, we're discussing this afternoon, uh, Great Danes as well. Yes. Um, although yeah. that falls a little bit in the in this last category, which obviously we'll get to. Um, now, a lot of them coming in, they have a significant class two malocclusion. So their their mand mandible is too short, their maxilla is too long, whichever way you want to look at it. But it also occurs with class three malocclusions as well. Now, these guys are often, um, we're going to talk about it soon, one of the problems is that they were erupting semi-okay, but they get a little caught. Again, we'll, we'll cover off on that. But also with the class three malocclusions, there's also a little bit of that fourth group where the jaw is just a little narrow. Um, so whilst you would expect uh, with our class three malocclusions, uh, our boxer dogs with the big jutting jaw, they should be out in front. Um, no, if they can certainly get caught as well. So really any of our malocclusions um, can sometimes wind up um, with these base narrow canines. Yeah, for sure. So I guess classically we would think of it as being the dogs with the overbite are the ones where the canine strike and traumatise the palate. But um, more and more we're seeing these ones where it's individual teeth out of position, whether it be um, maybe due to the maxilla being slightly too wide or the mandible being too narrow, um, there's not an actual length abnormality at all so um, it's definitely I guess something that you still need to look for even if you sort of look and go oh yeah you don't have an overbite don't have an underbite um, it's still certainly a possibility in um, pretty much any breed yeah yeah for sure and um, yeah the, the problem still just comes back to it's these big pointy canine teeth that can cross over to the other side of the mouth and cause trauma yeah, for sure. And I guess um, the things that will, I guess, it, a little bit hard to sort of um, explain this slide, but what we sort of um, see is that um, there are a number of factors that can contribute to the problem. Um, so not just the, the jaw length, as we sort of alluded to then. Um, it can be that we have persistent or retained baby teeth. So that's just, a, I guess, a, a note there as well. Um, the current terminology for retained canines is preferred that we say persistent. Um, honestly, does it matter? No. Um, <laughs> if you want to be completely correct, that's the way it's gone at the moment. Um, and that's something that we'll definitely um, touch on a lot more and go through in detail and show you some cases where that has been incredibly impactful for a lot of dogs. Um, we do tend to see the persistent canines more in the smaller and toy breed dogs. Um, we would probably see almost, I'd say, a case every week or two um, um, in mini dash hounds, they seem to be a breed that's incredibly prone to this and also your little toy poodles and again, your cavoodles and those sorts of breeds as well. Um, obviously, the, um, the teeth that can sort of um, contribute to this issue. Generally, if you've got your class three malocclusion or your underbite, the maxillary incisors can be a bit of an issue here. So um, essentially the um, maxillary third incisors and sometimes the seconds as well, um, the lower canine can get trapped behind those teeth and that can prevent them from um, basically uh, 
jutting forward and sort of um, not causing any trauma. Um, also, what we see with that is um, that specific entrapment will often result in poor eruption of the adult canine teeth if it's not dealt with. And that then leads on to other issues with um, periodontal disease associated with those teeth and the likes of that. Um, the mandibular incisors can actually sometimes be an issue as well. Um, in staffies, we see it a lot that um, they're just so tight in their bites now. They've got um, seemingly very, very big teeth for um, smaller muzzles. So their show standard has changed a bit and they are seeming to be breeding for a sort of um, slightly more feminine and shorter, narrower sort of muzzle. Um, what we seem to be seeing is that uh, the teeth have not shrunk in conjunction with the size of those muzzles. So we're seeing more overcrowding issues. Um, and one of the things that we see in these guys is that um, often the third incisors um, on the mandible specifically are potentially resulting in these lower canines being a little bit more upright than they should be, not being able to tip forward. Um, and they can be quite obstructive um, to the normal eruption pathway of the lower canine teeth. Um, the maxillary canines can also get in the way specifically or generally that's when we've either got retained baby teeth or when we've got um, a big overbite going on. So, yeah. So I guess these factors here um, well, as we've described, they're complicating factors. So there are other, often mostly other issues at play where we've got a jaw length issue or the teeth are, have, are particularly angled incorrectly or just in a very poor position. But these things will make it a lot worse. And, and for some of these cases, if it wasn't for these other teeth, they might just scrape by. Scrape by. But um, things like, as, as Beck has already mentioned, these other insides is just don't allow for as much movement of these erupting teeth and so they get they get quite caught um mm. but I, I think the the big one here and they're all we do see all of those things but i think the big one and the biggest one that we can all, all have a very positive effect with are these persistent deciduous canines i think picking them up um early when they're starting to occur uh, and dealing with those is is, is really important and we, we certainly will we'll cover off on that one um, I guess one of the thoughts I had when we were just kicking off, um, I, I, I did want to acknowledge that five months is a, this awkward time. Mm -hmm. um, we appreciate and we know that. It, they've finished their uh, vaccination schedule generally. Um, certainly now, well, we used to always obviously desex at six months, but we, we're even changing that now too. Yeah, we're and often so, seeing them for pro hearts where a lot of yeah, people are now yeah. using other preventatives instead of it being almost, you know, the most popular and only um, heartworm. So even if when even if we're still sticking with a few six month specific things like pro heart or, or still with desexing, we we just miss out on these guys, and it, it it is important if you've ever had the opportunity to really observe one of the, one of your patients going through eruption. It's very quick. I, 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 I'm still astounded. I think I'm more astounded now that I've had children that it takes years to erupt teeth, whereas with dogs, it's weeks. We're discussing these. These periods are measured in weeks. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I guess, I guess with these complicating factors, that's something that when you're looking in these mouths, um, run through that sort of checklist in your head. It's, okay, do we have a overbite, an underbite, or a specific malocclusion? And on top of that, what teeth, if any, are directly impacting or preventing these teeth to get out into the um, into their actual position? Is there a physical obstruction there, or is it just purely that they are a little bit more upright and um, just need a, a little bit of a tipping force applied to get them out into position? So that's really important stuff to be aware that all these things can contribute um, and impact the way we deal with these issues and what treatment options might be appropriate for the individual because it very much varies um, case by case there's no set recipe um, that sort of you know you can be provided with that gives you um, just this you know troubleshooting guide to how to get through each um, patient they're all very different yeah absolutely yeah and, and I guess the other thing as well to take away from that is that they're all not 
I'll just throw your hands up in the air. I can't do anything. I'm just going to have to refer because it's a jaw issue. Um, no, there are interventions with some of these guys that very, I think, quite easily be done mm. in practice. Uh, yeah. And you'll, again, you'll have a really positive effect. Absolutely. And they're super time specific, which is, that's the difficulty, as Aaron was yeah. sort of saying before, is that um, you're often not seeing these guys at the specific time. So it's, again, easy for us to say, because all we have to talk about is the teeth with a client. Yeah. Yeah. But when they come in and we see them, um, say for their deciduous dentition, we're talking about all of these things with them um, and teaching them um, and sort of hopefully getting them to actually monitor when the baby teeth are being lost. The first sign of the adult um, canines coming through and we've got some pictures. Um, there's some on the website actually that show clients exactly what um, the very earliest looking retained or persistent um, canines look like um, so they can be on the lookout for it and they know as soon as that happens that they need to get their pet in and get them examined so if any of these interceptive things can be done um, we don't miss that sort of short timeline because sometimes it's as tight as two two weeks that we've got to um, you know do any of these little things that we're going to talk to you about next if we miss that window then it's wait a little bit longer and go through much much more involved and invasive things to get things sorted for them yeah it, it's always easier to see these guys even several times i've got one i saw this morning and i'll be seeing once a week for the next few weeks um, it's easy to do that, build some rapport um, with these guys rather than find out at six months or seven months, ah, I missed it. And mm. I never I never say to people that oh, we missed the opportunity. I think that's, <laughs> that's a bit much. But, um, yeah, you, I sometimes think to myself, that, ah, we just missed a chance there with these guys. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So this one um, is a little case that we've still got a bit of ongoing stuff and we'll probably talk about her in a bit more detail in the webinars coming up. But she's a really, really good example of um, what persistent deciduous canine teeth can do. So one of the things I guess we're all trained to think of is that lingua verted or base narrow canines is always a problem with those, you know, those lower canine teeth and we take out the deciduous lower canine teeth and think, okay, yep, we're, you know, part way towards resolving the problem and no one really thinks of the maxillary canine teeth. Um, I guess I would never recommend um, removing those deciduous um, maxillary canine teeth as at the time of that we did the um, mandibulars as a preemptive sort of thing. Again, because of the things we spoke about um, last time in that you do have a risk of damage to the permanent tooth buds and the likes of that. And certainly not all um, patients go on and have persistent maxillary, um, I guess, canines. When it does occur, though, um, it can really put things um, or make a bit a of a real spanner in the world. Yeah, it does. Um, so it's, again, something that you need to be, if you're seeing these puppies, um, you potentially have removed deciduous mandibular canine teeth. It's something that at that, you know, um, discharge appointment where hopefully you've got a bit of time to run through things, really sort of emphasise the fact that, um you know, as the um, adult teeth are erupting, it's very important that the owners are checking, um, bringing them in regularly for you to see, and also um, being very aware that if they retain these um, maxillary teeth, that can really, really, really stuff things up for us. So what you can see here, um, we've got a really narrow, what we call the maxillary diastema. So that diastema is the space between the third incisor and the upper canine tooth. Um, that's something that we need to be wide enough to accommodate the actual um, tip of the erupting mandibular canine tooth. If that space is too narrow, as you can see here on this closed mouth view, the lower canine just cannot get out. It is physically trapped. So um, what we'll always see is essentially if you have a persistent mandibular um, canine tooth, it will also always sit um, outside or labial to the erupting permanent teeth. Um, for the maxillary canine tooth, the deciduous tooth is the one that's in the correct position and the adult tooth 
here is always going to come down in front of that deciduous tooth and by doing so it will narrow off that diastema and create a physical obstruction um, in a lot of cases that will prevent the lower canine from coming out into a, a normal position. So on the right hand side this dog has lost um, the deciduous tooth here she's hadn't lost it at an appropriate time and she still does have a bit of a, a narrow diastema through here um, but it's certainly not in as bad a position as this left hand side um, you can see on the x-ray as well there's certainly on that lower left um, there's absolutely some resorption going on so through here um the actual deciduous tooth is resorbing but the root does There's still, still a bit of root there though, yeah, yeah it's still sort of sitting here and that is acting as a physical obstruction to stop this tooth from dropping back so it's having to come through at this angle um we'll show you some pickies um in a minute of i guess um the sort of following couple of weeks after um this one was removed ideally this one's actually a bit late um we'd want to have done this probably a week or two um prior as soon as in these guys if you are look you know if you think there's going to be a problem and there's always the potential to be a problem if there's persistent teeth the minute that you see this tooth and this tooth or the mandibular canine and a um, just permanent and deciduous um, erupting or present at the same time you should have dealt with it yesterday, basically. You can't deal with them soon enough. Um, the sooner you get that tooth out of the way, the better the chance that the dog or the cat sometimes has of the permanent tooth dropping back or moving out into the correct position. Yeah, the, the different the definition of persistent is when the permanent is coming, is erupting through the gingiva. So that white spot through the gum, that's it. It's not as I used to think, certainly when I was in general practice, when the only thought I ever had about deciduous canines was, are they there when I'm doing a spay? Yeah, it's like, oh, we see them. Oh, we'll deal with them in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not persistent once everything's fully erupted. It's persi it should be gone. The deciduous teeth should be shed and then the permanent tooth should be erupting through. So, yeah, have a fiddle of it. Sometimes they are about to hopefully... Um, come out mm. um, but yeah so no it, the, and this this is the bit which is I think as I said an awkward time um, it's at five months they they vary I guess in their eruption periods um, I'm seeing young dogs like four and a half months sometimes so I generally quote to people four and a half to five and a half months is when they should be keeping their eye out for this yeah, some um, of the smaller breeds will be later again. So yeah. sometimes like your little toy breeds will be six and a half, seven months. Um, and that's the difficulty in that you don't know exactly when it's going to be. So you can't tell them exactly a fixed time to come in for a check. Um, in some ways you have to rely on the owners being a bit involved and proactive about things as well. The people, including yourselves, that are, that are involved and think, eh, this might be one of these guys that becomes an issue, Pre-book it. Okay, Pre-book it at four and a half months. If it turns into a, hey, how you doing? How's you been? Good. Great. Um, I appreciate it takes some time up in these, in, and we all have busy schedules. But um, I again, I'd rather follow them through slightly before they are up than, than find out weeks later that, that we've missed this opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, because it's always a frustrating thing when, you know, you see them and you think, oh, if only we'd, you know, got in three or four weeks ago, um, this would be so much more simple for um, the patient and, I guess, less costly for the owners as well. Okay. So, yeah, so the discussion with a client, um, we, we, we run, we, we get to, we get to run half hour consult, so we get to sit down and have a, pretty big yap with the with the people that we see um so what one of the main points we want to want to hit here um that intervention now if we actually get into these guys now um pro before it becomes a problem we may be able to prevent it ever being a problem so intervention is really uh, important uh, and we can sometimes with the right intervention we can avoid these really big things that we'll be talking about in these final webinars um we can avoid these really big involved procedures, um, hopefully just by doing some simple things. 
what we need to do and we need to make sure of these erupting canines, they need to have somewhere to go and they need to be able to get there. So I think this goes back to those complicating factors we discussed. So there may be incisors that are uh, trapping it. You can see, oh, they're not, not going to let that tip of that canine out. Or there's these persistent deciduous teeth that are they not allowing the canine to be in the correct position. So we have to do that. And so we want to be doing this. And again, coming back to this age, we want to do all of these kind of things when the canine tooth has this, still has this movement of eruption. This, those canines that are, can, are still erupting have a capacity to actually move around. They're not set in the bone yet. So if we can do these in early interventions, if they're indicated, um, hopefully that canine will still have enough time to move into a more correct position. Mm. Um, so I guess that we've, I've covered that there in that, that third point, saying that, and I, we do discuss ball therapy. Well, we, we do like ball therapy. We don't hang our hats on it. It's not something that's the cornerstone of all treatment for, for lingual inverted mandibular canines. But we certainly view it as a very a low risk intervention. I think the biggest risk you, you run is you may develop a dog with OCD for, for balls. Um, but apart from that, it's, it really is low impact, but it does have the capacity in the, in the correct cases, again, to avoid all these great big interventions. You're not, maybe you're not even having to um, extract even a, a single minor in, incisor. We'll talk about ball therapy a little further. So yeah, they're, sure. they're the big things we want to talk about. We want to talk about, well, clearly we talk about what the problem is and what the future would entail if we didn't intervene. But we discuss um, what we want to happen with these canines and how we're going to get them out into a more correct position. Yeah, for sure. And I guess talking about um, what could happen, I guess that's um, one of the things that is really important to discuss with people because they don't really have this concept of, um, you know, yeah, okay, you've told me it's got base narrow canines. Oh, yeah, they're about to hit the roof of the mouth or something, but so is that an issue? So as Aaron said to um, you earlier, um, sort of talk about the the complications of leaving things untreated. So one, they're sharp teeth um, and they are designed to traumatise tissue. So having them hit the roof of the mouth or even other teeth can be quite uncomfortable for the patient. Um, at worst, um, what we see is oronasal fistula development. The youngest I think we've seen it in is a dog at nine months of age, which was really young. Um, generally speaking, that sort of trauma um, it doesn't get too bad till one, maybe two years of age for a lot of these patients. Um, and essentially it's because you've got these hard, um, sharp objects that are trying to penetrate the tissue. They'll damage the soft tissue and the constant trauma to the bone as well will ultimately result in resorption and thinning out of the bone of the palate. Um, and eventually, whether or not it's one big, sharp sort of, you know, hard closing of the mouth, trying to snap at something or what have you, they will puncture through. Um, and the complications of that, as you all appreciate and not nice so it's um, chronic nasal disease discomfort and the likes of that we've also seen um, patients that have had um, actual I guess it was uh, generally seems to be the cats we've seen this in um, but sometimes you'll have the mandibular canine contacting the palatal side of the upper canine teeth um, most often you're just going to see deep pocketing and potentially the oronasal fistula there but we've also seen cases where um, the lower canine tooth has actually penetrated through the hard tissue of the maxillary tooth and created a pulp exposure and a dead um, maxillary tooth as a consequence um, you can end up with chronic um, pulpitis or inflammation within the root canals of the lower canines because of that constant occlusal and concussive trauma as well so there's a lot of things that can cause discomfort um, for these patients when things are left untreated and it's also important to sort of let people know that often you won't see clinical signs and symptoms because the dogs really don't know any different. Um, and often it's not until you've treated something where it's been a chronic issue that they'll notice change. Um, 
reportedly a lot of these guys are particularly mouthy so um asking that question honestly every dog uh, every puppy seems to be mouthy so um we've never really got an answer from someone um so not that you play on that but it's something that you can bring up and sort of ask pointed questions as do they always like to have something in their mouth do we've had ones where they've like stuffed little blankets or toys and will sleep with those in their mouths as well so questioning on that can sort of just bring an owner around to the to the um i guess uh, for them to understand and start thinking about oh, okay it does do these funny little things so maybe it is a bit more um a bit uncomfortable and it will help sort of bring them around and on side with what you're doing yeah the big thing for me and you and beck mentioned it multiple times when she was discussing that even from these seemingly minor issues of teeth clunking together or the horrible oronasal fistulas it's chronic it is happening all of the time. So these animals don't get to escape it. They don't get the weekend off. Okay, This is a consistent issue that they're experiencing. So absolutely, if it was an acute issue like a, a broken femur, absolutely, everyone notices that. But just this consistent, every time they close their mouth, something just is uncomfortable. and They get used to it. That becomes their life. You can't tell any difference with these guys. That's all they've ever known. Mm, for sure. So I guess this is just another picture um, demonstrating another sort of um, case where we've got persistent maxillary and mandibular canine teeth. So again, you can see that um, this maxillary has erupted in front of the deciduous. The actual um, diastema here isn't really too narrow, but we are seeing this mandibular canine. Um, you can see the tip of it just here. Um, in that current direction or um, trajectory, it looks like it's going to head um, upwards rather than in this direction. Um, so that's something where we really need to monitor and follow that through, but also um, removing the these deciduous teeth and these honestly they look like they're about to come out and from memory there wasn't a huge amount of root structure there this one had actually abscessed um because it had broken but that was a reason to take that out anyway um but yeah um that you, you can see on that one back on the right there that how lingua verted that man mm. that permanent yeah absolutely is. Yeah, yeah, it should be in this position where it's yeah. coming through in there, that position there. So already this this guy's already starting out two to three millimetres, which doesn't seem like much, but it's enough. Two to three millimetres inside where it should be. Um, yeah. Yeah, if left to its own devices, um, yeah, it's certainly going to cause some problems with that pup. Definitely. So step one for this guy is definitely get those deciduous teeth out. Um, and we did implement ball therapy and the owner was digitally manipulating those teeth as well. And we did achieve a pretty good result. He also has a bit of a um, issue up here. Um, that third incisor is quite malformed with a lot of enamel hyperplasia and the root was um, not formed properly either. It also has like a bit more of a fleshy sort of um, swelling and change in shape of the maxilla there. And that very much contributed in this case to this mandibular canine really struggling to get out because even though it was labially tipped appropriately it was at the right angle the maxilla was sort of sitting a little bit further out than it normally did so it had to achieve a greater angle to get out into a non-traumatic position this is just another one yeah. <laughs> same sort of um scenario it's another one because we see so many of them these it's, it's not an uncommon scenario yeah, absolutely these, yeah these persistent deciduous teeth so they're just blocking the way they've they're holding the car park and this canine needs to go somewhere. The permanent need, needs to go somewhere. And it will always, so maxillary, as Beck mentioned this before, so maxillary tend to always go mesial. They always go forward. And mandibulars, um, they always go become much more lingua verted. Now that's the general pattern that you see. And both of those positionings make things worse. Um, the diastema closes off and if they weren't lingua verted before, yeah, these came up, the mandibulars are coming up absolutely midline, well, not midline, yeah, but sure. coming up very narrow. Yeah. 
So this is a little bit of a different one. So when we spoke about um, that. Anyway. Field <laughs> Actually, could you just, just flick back a bit? Um, back. Um, Erica had a question there. Yeah, yes, correct. Erica, that is, um, that's a, 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 a persistent, what's that? A, yes. A 606, here. yep, well spotted. It is. So that one would have been flicked out at the same time. <laughs> um, so how would that affect permanent? They don't seem to, in general, be as impactful, especially the smaller premolar teeth. Um, certainly the, um, I guess, the deciduous premolar three and four can be an issue. Um, so I guess there's no permanent, mol sorry, deciduous molars. Um, the one that looks like a small molar one is actually this deciduous fourth premolar. Um, so, and the one that looks like a mini carnassial tooth is actually the deciduous third premolar. So that's something that stuffed me up for a long time. Um, but those ones specifically seem to be more of an issue. If they um, retain those, then the um, the permanent sort of carnassial tooth will often come out um, very much almost labiaverted, so with the tips pointing towards the cheek. Um, so that's something... I don't know why, but mini schnauzers seem to see that a lot in. Um, so that's something to look out for. And if, again, you see that and they aren't mobile and you're starting to have teeth come through at odd angles, then also removal of those ones um, would be recommended. And if we're in those mouths doing the deciduous canines and there's any other deciduous teeth still there and they're becoming mobile and they've got um, resorption of the roots and permanent teeth coming through, we'll remove those at the same yeah. time yeah I, I think it also it also speaks to the this issue whereby canines they really only need to be to be out by a couple of millimeters and they can cause problems mm. whereas with that premolar two there like honestly if it's two millimeters palatal is it going to cause a problem for the dog no it's physically not really going to no. it may, co may cause some issues with some periodontalities might get a bit overcrowded but thankfully um, it's not such a large tooth that it's going to, it's poor occlusion by two, three millimetres is really going to cause any yeah. Especially sort of these rostral premolars, they don't sort of, I guess they interdigitate um, in that pinking shear effect. They don't um, come tip to tip or like Aaron said, have such a tight sort of occlusal relationship. So again, if they're inland or pointed out or a little bit of an odd angle, um, then it's often not very impactful yeah. Yeah, they just they just become a wonky tooth and yeah. and they don't become clinical. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, so this little one is, again, a little variation of the theme. So this is a class three dog or a dog with an underbite that has linguaverted canine teeth or is um, on the way to having linguaverted canine teeth because they are only about 50% erupted at the moment. And what you can see is here specifically, this third incisor is becoming what we call labioverted. Um, it's actually being pushed out in an awkward angle. Um, this one is on the right as well, but not to such a significant degree. Um, and you can see here on this angle that this lower canine tooth is basically directly hitting the back or the side of this tooth. Um, if left unchecked, um, what we'll commonly see is that, again, that lower canine tooth will become trapped. In this case, it's not likely to cause soft tissue trauma or oronasal fistulas over time, but it will continually traumatise the back of that third incisor. Um, you'll often get increased periodontal disease in that spot, but also um, the Inclusive contact and um, constant contact between those teeth can cause, um, I guess, inflammation within the pulp. Um, and that's really hard to sort of determine whether that's happening or not. Um, in people, you'd whinge about sort of an achy tooth, but for these guys, they can't do that. So it's something that often goes completely um, undetected and unreported. Um, 
as I said earlier as well, one of the other things that we'll see quite commonly in these patients if this isn't dealt with is that that constant contact during eruption between the lower um, canine and the incisors will often result in a poorly erupted um, lower canine tooth, so it will be shorter than what it um, should be. And that way you'll end up with enamel sitting underneath the gum margin. Um, and like if it's if you've got enamel below the gingival sulcus, the gum or the tissue cannot attach to that. Um, so you end up with a pseudo pocket or a pocket around that tooth that's there from day one. And it's basically going to accumulate over time, plaque, hair, debris, and set up a case for early periodontal disease in these guys. So again, it's something that we want to treat, not from that, um, not only from sort of that discomfort point of view and the risk of trauma to the roof of the mouth, but also so from risk of um, periodontal disease of those mandibular canine teeth long term. And teeth occluding in an inappropriate fashion, clunking together. Again, it's not acute pain, but it's uncomfortable. Mm. Um, and whilst to some extent you can get used to it, um, I hope none of you have got any fillings whatsoever. But if you've ever had a filling and it's been done, and it's been just a little large, and now it feels to you like it's about one centimetre too big. Rest assured, it's like microns too small, uh, too large. Yeah. So, and that's uncomfortable and annoying to us. Um, so, yes, you can imagine uh, tooth on tooth, inappropriate tooth on tooth contact. Uh, yeah, just over time, it's just annoying. Yeah, and I guess in these cases, that's how we describe that to the owner. And also um, the other issue is these other incisors, so especially your centrals here, they are very likely contacting the mucosa um, lingual to those mandibular incisor teeth. And again, if left unchecked, that's going to cause um, discomfort to the patient. You'll initially end up with indentation, ulceration of the um, mucosa. And if that is not dealt with, then ultimately, again, um, that constant contact between teeth and bone you'll end up potentially with bone exposure, loss of bone behind the mandibular incisor teeth and early loss of those. So um, for us, yeah, absolutely. Um, at this age, as an interceptive treatment, because our mandibular canine teeth are the most important teeth, I guess, in this little area here, we're weighing up the, um, I guess, the benefit of incisors versus canines. Canines are going to win. Um, for this patient, we would recommend recommend extraction um, for this one specifically I would recommend probably extraction of all of those maxillary incisors um, the thirds because they're causing direct trauma with the um, obstruction of the eruption of the mandibular canines and the first and second incisors because they're causing trauma to um, the floor of the mouth um, the other thing, I guess, if you're trying to convince a client to do this, um, because the earlier you do this, the better, often combining it with desexing if you feel that's appropriate. Um, the earlier you do this, and if you do this while the mandibular canines are still erupting, they will almost always um, clear basically that soft tissue and erupt in a, in a pathway that's completely non-traumatic. Um, the way I sort of discuss, um, I guess, maxillary extraction, um, incisor extractions with clients and explain it so they find it um, I guess less Powerful. confronting is that these teeth are designed to work like a pair of tweezers so the maxillary incisors should sit just in front of the mandibular incisors um, they basically use those teeth to pluck um, I guess hair they use them to nibble on things um, to sort of tear um, stuff, I guess the hide off an animal um, for this, these patients, those teeth are almost useless. They certainly don't work in the way that they should. And I describe it as trying to pluck a hair with a pair of tweezers that the tips don't actually meet. They're fairly useless to them. Um, also loss of maxillary incisors doesn't outwardly change the appearance of the dog too much. Um, the only time owners are really going to see those teeth as if the dog yawns or if it's baring their teeth to bite them. Um, the mandibular incisors are often the ones that give these dogs their character. Um, so they're the ones that we often, um, or owners, I guess, are more um, motivated to keep. So discussing the fact that 
loss of the teeth isn't actually very impactful for the dog. It won't impact the way that they eat. They eat with their back teeth. They'll still be able to play. My neighbor's dog, I took out all their, her maxillary incisors. She's a little Boston. She still pulls my dog around and my dog's 11 kilos. She fish, And this little guy's four kilos. She still drags my dog around on her bed and can pull the bed from one side of the room to the other. So it, again, doesn't really impact. Um, and she can, you know, destroy a toy in minutes and pull the stuffing out so they will adapt they will do fine without them sometimes in these brachycephalics where the tongue's a little bit big um, you will see the tongue the tip of the tongue poke out when they're a bit sleepy um, so that's something to warn the owners of but again it's purely cosmetic it's not a medical concern for them at all and they're not the dogs that walk out with their tongue hanging out everywhere um, it's sometimes just you know when they're sleeping the tip of the tongue will be a bit more prominent and that's because the tongue's too big for their mouth anyway so. So currently, so if you're looking at these maxillary incisors, is the pro column is empty. They do not provide a positive experience or function or anything for these dogs. But the, the con column has got a few things. It may be called, maybe, and what, what we're focused on, it's, it's blocking uh, the eruption of these canines. So that's, going, that's a major issue. But also the other thing, um, these dogs with the class three, the remaining incisor ones, so which is what Beck was sort of alluding to, um, they're not in the way of the canine, but we would often we often will remove these as well, not least of which is because they look funny with just a couple of nanny McFee <laughs> hanging out there. But but also they they actually can cause soft tissue trauma to the mandible as well. So yeah, so the, the pro col column for the upper incisors is empty. The con column, however, does have a few things in it. And so, yeah, I agree. I, I just don't think that uh, those, this case here, that those upper uh, or the maxillary incisors are worthwhile at all. They yeah. cause problems. Yeah, for sure. Oh, and also I am in the habit now of telling people that these are permanent teeth and they will not get another set of teeth after you yeah. these. Make <laughs> someone at discharge us. So when will the next lot come through? That's what we yeah, just make it, make, very make it very clear. Because as, as we all probably have heard, I think there's a lot of anecdotal stuff about it, but certainly loss of teeth apparently is a big point, sore point for um, suing people. I actually, do you know of anyone that's ever had that happen, Beck? No, I actually no. don't either, but we say it. <laughs> no. um, but people, we all know, people do get concerned about extraction of teeth. It's quite weighs quite heavily on them. Um, but yeah, make it clear, this is it. They, they, they are permanent. They are being removed not getting any more yeah. but that's for the good of the patient because if we don't want more from that we have to remove those as well so again another we will when we're putting this together over the last couple of weeks we, we uh, flick through a lot of we have lots of photos guys mm. so many photos um but we flicked through and saw this guy and we both liked it because we can see nice square on photograph here and we can see uh that those uh Persistent uh, mandibular deciduous canines have caused uh, what's that the 304 to come up really lingua verde. Okay, again, three, four, five millimeters maybe inside of where it should be. Okay, so hopefully we can see that with this case right here, if we were to inter when well, we're about to uh, intervene here, uh, extract uh, the uh, 704 entirely. That is an important thing, and we'll talk about that with treatment. If we can do that with, with this, this pup, hopefully this, this erupting canine who's still moving through the bone of the mandible is going to find out, oh, okay, it's going to be a little easier to head over here and we'll have a very positive effect. Uh, yeah, it looks like it, Danielle. I think I hope yeah, we took some radio. Permanent were that. absent in these ones. Yeah, okay. And also um, this one did not work. So um, that's another thing to talk to owners about. You can do all these things and it gives things the opportunity to improve. The main risk is financial, um, I guess, and also anesthesia and the likes of that. But the, the biggest risk for these guys and for the owners is a financial risk that they spend this money and we still end up needing to do more intervention. So we're also always pretty clear on that. It's their best chance. 
It is um, one of the least invasive options. Ultimately, if it works, it's one of the least inexpensive options that we have available, but there's always a chance that it won't work. So make sure you, you do mention that, um, that you don't sort of promise the world for these guys. Um, this one ended up not erupting at all. So um, for whatever reason, um, you can also see that the 404, um, if I get back to the screen, um, there's a little bulge there where the 404 is trying to come through. Um, we took these deciduous out. This guy was already, it was a little chihuahua. Um, he was already about six and a half months of age at this time. Um, and you can see that for him, his permanent um, mandi maxillary canines are fully erupted. So that's also a sign that these guys are a bit slow and not doing exactly what they wanted. Um, we actually discussed with this owner whether or not we um, even did this procedure or not, um, or just went in and took everything out. He wanted to give it a go, was very um, happy to give it a try. And obviously financial um, constraints weren't an issue for him. We did that and a month later, nothing had changed. So we went and took out those permanent canines as well. Can't hear you, Aaron, you're muted. Uh, you can't tell that there's, um, whether it still has eruption potential or not. Um, but whilst it's not erupted, we hope, and, and at this age, you know, you're not going to do this as a five-year-old dog, but whilst at this age, I think it's still, um, it's it has a potential. Um, yeah, didn't work for this guy. It didn't. So we've sort of already run through treatment a little bit, but back to little um, this little one, Poppy. Um, so you can see specifically, um, I guess, on that left-hand side, um, we had that really, really narrow diastema. Um, so what we had recommended for her was to remove that um, deciduous canine tooth. Um, I actually gave her a pretty guarded prognosis for that to really do anything um, her mum's super dedicated and will do anything um, so she elected to go ahead with that procedure and then implement ball therapy um, she was poppy was a really good girl and she took to ball therapy very well and you can see two weeks later we've actually had um, fairly significant improvement for her this isn't, it's definitely not perfect, but we have had widening of this diastema. And if you look at um, this picture up here on the right, um, you can see that the tip of the canine is now sort of just visible um, here within the diastema. It's still sort of a little upright and impacting. And this space here is still a little narrow to allow um, the mandibular canine to completely tip outwards. But in a two week period with ball therapy, we've actually seen a fairly significant improvement for her. Yeah. This is um, just a series of pickies. So this was the day of treatment. This was two weeks later. And this one on the right was four weeks after treatment. For me, um, when she's actually sitting with her mouth closed, that mandibular canine tooth, whoops, just blowing it up on everyone. Um, that mandibular canine tooth is actually not traumatic. It's still tight. Um, and it's by far, you know, a long way from perfect, but that's her with her mouth completely closed. And you can actually see a little gap around that, um, the tip of that tooth. It's not actually impacting and causing soft tissue trauma. Um, she was pretty comfortable. The right-hand side had actually improved even more than that. So for me, I would have been perfectly happy to sort of just leave that be. Um, we'll come back to her at a later date because her mum really wanted her perfect. So we've done a few more things with her since then. Um, but yeah, essentially for her, um, that um, even late, I guess for me, what I would consider late extraction of that persistent tooth has actually made a pretty significant um, difference, especially when we manage to combine it with ball therapy. Um, and, you know, for me, if that's what we achieved and her mum was happy to stop at that, um, I would have been satisfied because at that point in time, there was no active trauma from the tooth. It's definitely not a show quality bite, but it's good enough. It's comfortable for the patient. Um, and I don't think she would have any long-term issues um, or at least no current issues. And it's something you could keep an eye on in the coming sort of um, months to years as to whether or not that progressed any further. Um, 
actually that I I can't remember where we were gonna, where whether we're gonna specifically cover it or not, Beck, but um and it did might even deserve its own webinar yeah. in itself. But I think it's important. Um and I think we're recognizing it in ourselves a little more recently. Um we have to always be careful and always come back to the clinical picture. Um, now that's not always clear when we understand that these dogs are not screaming, they're not pouring blood out of their mouth, things like that. But mm. I think we it 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 is our responsibility to really try and understand the clinical situation a little better. So whilst we can see with with Poppy here on the right that um, well, it still looks like it's touching, isn't it? Um, whilst tight, the, our manipulation with this pup while she's conscious and seeing where it really strikes, it did not occur to us. Occur to us. It did not seem to us that this would be causing her trauma. Yeah, and that's the difficult thing with photos as well. They only yeah. show you, they don't show you it in 3D. So when yeah. we're opening and closing um, in a lot of the staffies that are tight like this, you'll feel the lower canine run up the sort of side of the maxillary and you'll feel that sort of tooth on tooth contact as they close. Whereas for her, she was very free in a movement. Mm. I guess to, just to address um, Danielle's question a little bit more, I know you've had in the chat, Aaron, is the reason even if her mum hadn't sort of wanted to keep all teeth, um, I wouldn't actually in her case have suggested removal of the third incisor because it's not the thing causing the problem. Um, for this, it's direct obstruction of the maxillary tooth that's causing the issue. So that maxillary canine tooth is directly blocking um, the mandibular canine from moving labially. The third incisor, yes, it's contributing to the problem of that narrow diastema, uh, and removing it opens it, but it doesn't actually clear the pathway for that lower canine to move labially. The only way to clear that pathway is to get that tooth or the maxillary canine tooth out of the way. And I guess in theory you could remove it, but we're always pretty hesitant to do that. Um, or we needed to sort of move it or shift the tooth orthodontically. Um, so again, that's all part of the decision-making. Like it's not just widening the diastomite by taking a tooth away. It's looking at exactly what the problem is and what's causing the obstruction and dealing with that tooth specifically or um, that, you know, in that sort of way. So there's, again, it's that whole um, no sort of um, recipe fits every dog perfectly. You've really got to look at all those individual features. Yeah. Yeah, that that is hard, and I, I think also as as a, just a general comment um, to everyone that that ever does send stuff our way, if we happen not to do a treatment or we do it, that's quite different to what you were ever thinking. Um, it's just, I guess, because of the very very specifics that we're seeing with these patients, yeah. not because you're wrong or anything like that. Um, yeah. No, the the cases coming through to us are actually very well identified, um, but the nuances and again, one, two millimeters makes so much difference between whether a sometimes whether we treat or not, um, but, but the difference between what treatment is going to be best for these patients. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, with this picky. What? Yeah. Look, I think we, we've popped this one in. It's this, this dog's had a couple of things done with it. Um, I, initially we, we saw this, this image and it popped up and I guess what I wanted to sort of get from it initially was that, we can see that those uh, permanent canines have only just come through that the gingiva here. They, they, these guys are still currently erupting. So I guess I want to use this image to, to hammer home the point that this is when we want to perform some of these procedures whilst the permanent canine is erupting still. So what this, this dog has had done, and we weren't able to uh, obtain a, a recent photograph, which is a bit of a shame because uh, we have seen the dog um, since and it's it's marvelous this dog's looking great um but what this dog has had done uh is uh the uh, what is that that's the 704 has been removed so the deciduous um, you mean canine here. the what six, uh, six uh, us yeah sorry the upper See, left. I, I, I don't even know what trident system means but um yeah so the deciduous canine has been removed so we've made some space mm -hmm. and we've removed an obstruction yeah, so I did do this one surgically. Um, it had 
it's like resorption mid root. And um, I guess I was worried that if I did it just by a simple closed extraction, I'd leave the apex behind. So there's actually a suture that's to here. Um, and I guess one thing to just note, I didn't suture it all the way up tight against this erupting canine tooth because I don't want my suture to then act as another physical obstruction or block. So I've just got one little suture back here against that um, first premolar, just so the gingiva is not gaping, but I've still got plenty of room for that maxillary canine to come through. And that, that, that I think that ties into that's part of the explanation that we give to to people about what we're expecting to happen these deciduous teeth are holding a space we remove that obstruction now we have a permanent tooth that wants to move now it's easier for this permanent tooth instead of trying to wedge its way and push through uh, the maxillary bone it can actually go hang on there's a there's this little space behind me here it's easier for me to move back into this position which thankfully is the more correct position yeah. So that's often the, I describe that a lot. To, yeah, to sort of just the path of least resistance, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So one of one of the procedures that um, you, if you've ever spoken to us or emailed us, um, we will have probably spoken about. Um, sometimes just really just mentioning the name of it, um, not always in a lot of detail. But we we mentioned this this phrase gingival wedge. Um, now, I guess more officially, it's a gingivoplasty. So we're changing the shape of the gingiva uh, in mm. the diastema here. Uh, so this is an image of a, a dog that's had a, a gingival wedge performed. So what we can see here is in this, this diastema uh, of between 103, 104, what we've done is we've removed some of the gingiva mucosa. Um, we don't usually remove maxillary bone. I, not to go that deep mm. um, i have in the past with some animals but the problem is you just you're leaving exposed bones that's not particularly pleasant but what we're doing here is we're changing uh, the shape of the tissue that the canine tooth is striking so i guess the way i often describe to people so instead of the canine tooth coming up against something flat and just driving straight into it we change it to an angle and so as this, again, it's all about the erupting tooth. As, we, as this erupting tooth is coming up, it strikes this angled plane and moves out. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to guide, so it's orthodontics here. We're trying to guide these erupting canines while they're still moving, they're not set in bone, we're trying to guide them into a more correct position. Yeah, and whether or not we're truly achieving an actual tipping movement of the tooth or we're simply removing that physical sort of soft tissue obstruction and instead of the tooth then impacting into it um, by sort of removing it for that period, the, tish, um, the tooth bypasses it and then the, the tissue remodels somewhat around the tooth. Um, it doesn't really matter as long as it sorts the issue out, um, but we'll always use this combined with ball therapy as yeah. well. And I guess the beauty of this procedure is that it is, again, one of those things where the risk is financial. Um, it doesn't really sort of, um, I guess... Uh, it won't guess, set them back if it doesn't no. work. It won't take away other options from no. them if it doesn't work. They'll still have all of the options that they would have had um, if we had done this procedure or not. So it is, it's purely, I guess, a, a mainly sort of a financial risk for these people and some people are more than willing to take it. And there's others that we're like 99% certain this will work. Um, so we'll really sort of, you know, push them towards that. But there's others where it could go one way or the other um, and we'll very much sort of just lay it out on the table and give them the option and some people will choose not to do it um, others will choose to do that but I guess the thing that we really want to spend just the last little bit talking about is ball therapy and um, we touched on it last time and sort of discussed why it didn't really work to move um, I guess fully erupted teeth and why using it for deciduous teeth doesn't really do much um, but again if we've done um, deciduous extractions on um, pets we'll always talk about ball therapy at that point in time and encourage owners to start um, getting their dogs used to um, essentially playing with and um, you know playing these mouth games and ball games and stuff so if they end up in a position where they're this 
technique is useful, it's already in play um, and the dog's not having to go through this training period to get used to it right when the teeth are erupting. At that point, we want them already adapted to and, and willing to sort of be um, active participants in it. Um, so one of the things you've really got to um, try and do is find that Goldilocks ball and that's a little bit different for every single patient. Um, the key characteristics that we want in these balls are that we need it to be something that's fairly firm um, and not very compressible. So a tennis ball is not going to work. I hate tennis balls anyway because they're too abrasive on the teeth but um, something that the dog can squeeze and collapse is not really appropriate. We want something that's that Kong um, um, rubber density um, so it has, yeah a little bit of um, give to it but has resistance and um, some give back so Kong do do balls um, they don't have a massive range in sizes so um, you know if they fit for a patient great we found another brand um, that they do do a few different sizes in and that's kazoo um, they're fairly firm they have a smooth rubber one that's a textured rubber and the textured one also comes on a rope um, so some dogs would prefer to sort of chase it around and grab it um, with the owner pulling on the rope and that can be really effective because i'll often bite a bit harder as well um, when they're actually um, playing sort of a tug game so finding something that's a a fairly sort of firm, dense, not super, super compressible thing is good. Um, the ones that I find really hard to find the right size um, ball for are the toy breeds. Um, the orange just popped a link in the chat as well um, for some of those the balls from Kazoo. They're also quite inexpensive. I think from the pet shops, they're like $10 or something. Um, so there's something that owners can buy and not have to outlay a whole lot of cash, whereas the Kong ones might be $30 or so. Unfortunately, they're not currently a sponsor, so this is a free one for them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I uh, can't see the link. Oh. oh. We can put it. Um, oh, hang on. <laughs> what did you do? I was better? sending it just doing me and you. <laughs> <laughs> That might be better for everyone. Um, yeah, so essentially you want something, as you can see, the picture with the green ball, that's the ideal ball that we want. Um, we want it to sort of the curvature of the ball to sit sort of between the canine teeth. And when they bite, we want it to put an outwards tipping force on the teeth. If it's too big, the ball will sit sort of too high and the canines won't be tipped out. And if it's too small, again, they'll just be sort of biting it. And they'll also often hold it too far back in their mouth as well so um having we will have we have a few different sizes in consult with us um and we'll often sort of just see what size ball um sort of seems to work um and then make a recommendation to the owner that they need something that's a four or five or six centimeter diameter um i'd say probably five centimeter diameter seems to be the most commonly used one um and the kazoo definitely do that one um they also make that yeah. the one i like that they make as well and i think you should get both uh they make tug the one, one that has a hole in it they can do tug of war and so if they're able to perform some tug of war with the dog as well obviously you can everyone can imagine this quite easily as the dog's biting down trying to stop you pulling that ball out of its mouth that's a lot more force and so it, it's all about force here we want to provide a force that's going to tip these teeth out mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah a bit of tug of war um, have them carry the ball as much as possible yeah and I guess the take-home message for the clients is that they cannot do it often enough they only have um, you know a two to three week window where this will be super effective um, the time it's most effective is when the actual teeth are act actively moving through the tissue and erupting they actually have fairly limited root formation at that point in time and while they are moving you can redirect their course of eruption with far more ease and once they're fully erupted and fairly well anchored in the jaw 
Um, so sort of having them um, doing that from the time of eruption to the time that they're completely erupted is ideal. You're not going to, if, you, if a dog doesn't need it um, and the teeth are actually going to be okay anyway, you're actually not going to do any harm. If you did happen to have, you know, a patient that did it so much that they over tip the teeth, as soon as they're erupted, they're going to come back and sort of lock into position anyway. We'll actually um, inadvertently sort of overcorrect things and tip them too far with some of our orthodontic appliances um, and they will naturally then over a couple of weeks come back into a normal position once we remove all of that so um, it's certainly <laughs> something that's ever going to put a patient in a worse position so even if it's not perfectly appropriate um, again it's one of those things that's not likely to do harm or create more of an issue than that was there already. We'll probably touch on that over the next couple of webinars when we specifically talk about, um, I guess, more advanced orthodontics. Um, we'll talk about forces, et cetera, and, and retainment, I guess, is what really what Beck was touching on. There. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing, I guess, is how often to do it. Um, the recommendation is there's actually only one study that's really been done on ball therapy and looking at its effectiveness. Um, and they, I think, honestly, just made an arbitrary figure up and got people to do it that much. Um, but it was three times a day for 15 minutes each session. So we would encourage people to do that much, but also say as, as often as possible. If you have a patient that doesn't take to the actual ball therapy itself you can also get clients to sort of digitally manipulate the tooth so they can do it either by hooking um, their fingers behind the tooth and basically putting an outward sort of force on the teeth or if they prefer they can come in from the front of the mouth with their thumbs and sort of rotate out and put a force on them that way and if it's a guy, tell them not to try and break the dog's jaw, but it should be essentially putting an indentation in your, um, in your thumb or your finger, and it should be uncomfortable for you to do it. Um, <laughs> if you do it enough, it, it will sort of hurt a little bit, so you do need to put reasonable pressure, but you're not putting all of your force and your might against it, especially on these little lids. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, this is the <laughs> short section, isn't it, this one? And we've spoken about it a lot. What are the complications of sort of doing these things like removal of deciduous uh, or persistent deciduous teeth or ball therapy um, and even your gingival wedge? The complications are essentially that, well, worst case scenario, they're not going to respond to treatment and they may need future and further interventions. Um, that can be disappointing when you've taken teeth out. Um, but if they were the right teeth, so if, say, if you've taken a third incisor out and um, the canine, and it was an appropriate thing to do and the canine tooth just hasn't been able to slip past, um, it can also set you up for then being able to do um, further orthodontic treatment or the likes of that. And and be ready to go um, without having to take teeth out to make space before you do that. So again, it's not always a loss. Um, if you end up with a complete obstruction and having to do a height of a reduction or take canine teeth out or something, then you might feel a bit disappointed. But again, loss of an incisor is pretty minor to the patient. And if you've had good communication with the client and they've been aware of all of this um, along the way, then it's, it's generally not a concern for them. So no, look, obviously there are uh, anesthesia complications, specific surgical complications. Um, last webinar, we, of course, we were just talking a, little, a lot more about uh, deciduous tooth extraction at a younger age where we were quite concerned about um, causing trauma to the permanent tooth. That can still happen at this age. It's not, it's a lot less likely. The enamel has formed now. It's really out of the way. So it's it's unlikely that you'll have enamel problems if you're aggressive and if you're going, if you've really had two packs of Wheaties in the morning, <laughs> you, you could damage the, the developing roots. That is a real possibility. Unlikely, uh, but it's a possibility. But as Beck said, the really the biggest thing with these things is that we may put a lot of time, effort, money into doing these things and... Uh, it doesn't work and we're we're still then having to face some further more definitive treatments um, down the line.
Yeah, for sure. Um, Erica's just asked a question about um, the Kong tennis balls and stuff. Um, I guess my answer to that is them saying that it's non-silicon based is probably more a marketing thing than anything. Um, I had a dog in yesterday. He was five and I took out three canines. It was actually one of Danielle's patients. Um, he doesn't even play with tennis balls. He plays with, um, it's a Kong ball with just some texture to it. Um, and he's managed to wear his canine teeth down to the point of pulp exposure on three out of the four um so it's not even necessarily um the fact that i guess the fluffy texture of the tennis balls is something we dislike um, because it is in itself naturally abrasive but it's the combination of the um the coating on the toy saliva and dirt or sand or those other sort of things that they pick up in the environment that then becomes super abrasive and wears the teeth down so um yeah i've had the last few weeks we've had like 18 month year old sorry 18 month old dogs um coming through with fairly significant wear as well and again um one of them has been a tennis ball um sort of dog the other one hadn't both of them lived on soils that were sandy or went to the beach and some of the primary ways they were exercised down the beach was throwing the ball and bringing it back so um yeah it's not just I guess tennis balls per se but it's what that um whatever material um the toy is coated in or made of um if it's something that can pick up grit and dirt and they live in an environment where that's occurring any of those things can be a problem for them yeah the, the primary object itself is usually not particularly abrasive um like you could rub well it's not going to be nice but you can rub a tennis ball on yourself all day it's just going to make it a bit not red it's it's as beck said it's the sand that's silica uh, that's mm -hmm. And, and that's in, in soil as well, obviously. Um, that's the real sort of problem here. And so objects that can retain um, soil and sand and then keep that in the mouth, yeah, that, that's where your, your problem is. Yeah, lies. and we see it with all sorts of things. We see it with frisbees. Um, we had that Kelpie a couple of years ago who was only maybe under two years of age, obsessed with the frisbee and was exercised that way and he'd let it basically spin in his mouth as he caught it and he had wear all the way back yeah. and he had, I think, again, three canines with pulp exposures. So he didn't allow a frisbee anymore. Um, yeah. <laughs> And also um, the other thing to look for is, um, I guess, you, um, even soccer balls and basketballs. And there's a ball called a staffy ball, which is a big round one. So those dogs are the ones that will basically roll those bigger balls along and it won't actually cause wear to the tips of the teeth and flatten them off. It'll actually um, wear the canines in an oblique angle. So if you have them coming in with these perfectly smooth but sort of um, obliquely angled and sharp pointy um, canine teeth, it's often because they're rubbing their, um, their mouths or their teeth along and it's pushing a ball along that's yeah, a bit they, bigger than do that. They're trying to grab those large balls but they keep grabbing and it, it, it slips out when you keep doing yeah. that and it, it's yeah, yeah it just wears those teeth yeah yeah so, so anyone got any more questions or anything it doesn't have to be perfectly related either no. <laughs> um I, 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 again if you're writing a question keep writing um mm -hmm. i was just gonna say uh thank you uh, so that really, I guess, really wraps up um, that examination at, at, at five months of age. Again, a little bit of leeway, four and a half, five and a half. When we're seeing permanent erupt, the, the start of these eruptions of the permanent canine teeth, these animals, sometimes there are interventions that we can perform um, that will allow the canines to move into a correct position. I guess uh, an important part of what we're trying to get across tonight was that um, Sometimes it's it, things are blocking the way. Sometimes there's some obstructions. Uh, it may be a deciduous um, canine tooth that's that is persistent. It's not it's not been shed yet. It may be some other incisors. Um, but sometimes there are some interventions we can do now. Um, and and this one, it's all about timing. So any patients you're seeing as young pups that that, that are linguaverted that you may have also particularly if you've seen them for extraction of the lingual verted uh, deciduous mandibular canines. Um, this should be something that we are advising that we do want to see them um, for a check. 
and see where the permanent ones are when we first see those permanent um, mandibular canals start to erupt. Yeah, for sure. Um, Danielle just asked about the cats with the sort of overclosure and contact with the tips of the upper carnassials and the soft tissue below the mandibular molar teeth and what age we sort of make a call on them. Um, I guess I like to wait till sort of seven and a half, eight months of age before I look at doing a dontoplasty um, simply because it gives that tooth a little bit more time to mature and the dentine a little bit more time to thicken up and it allows you to take a little bit more tooth material away. Um, if you're doing it earlier than that, with um, I guess within the first couple of months after eruption, you have fairly significant and rapid, um, I guess, tooth development, so full root formation, and they will lay down a lot of dentine relatively quickly. Um, so waiting till that age just gives you a touch more leeway in terms of how much tooth material you can take away without having a pulp exposure. Um, if they really, really wanted to extract, you could potentially do it earlier because it's yeah. once it's there, it doesn't really go away on its own. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's interesting, Danielle. I'm seeing a lot more of those for whatever reason. I think probably because we're actually looking. Um, but yeah, there's certainly more of those around for sure. Excellent. Cool. So thank you guys. Um, it was really good to see yeah. so many people come in on again tonight. So yeah, um, yeah I guess if um, anyone you know wants to didn't get on and wants to sort of um i guess have a look we'll pop this up on our youtube channel and we yep. will look at also sort of doing the next one in the series which is a bit more specific sort of interventions with um i guess height reductions um what we talk to people about that a little bit more of the orthodontic sort of stuff and also obviously extraction of mandibular canine teeth and um i guess talking to owners about that, um, maybe taking a little bit of the fear about it as well. Um, and there's also, I think, another feedback form that will probably just be flipped to you guys afterwards. So feel free to give comments, criticisms, all that sort of stuff, anything else that you want. Um, I guess we want to continue this in the longer term as well. Um, so any other topics that you think would be particularly useful as well, um, throw them at us also. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you for giving up your, your evening. Yes, and again, absolutely. Uh, another actually big one. It's funny, we've been thinking, oh, it won't take too long. <laughs> but yeah, um, there, there's a lot of detail, I suppose. Uh, so hopefully you've, you you can take that away and, and utilise that with maybe even tomorrow you'll have that young dog come in and it's got those persistent canines and you'll know how to jump on it and explain it and get, yeah, get this dog sure. into a much better position. Cool. All right. Thanks heaps, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.